Welcome back to Classic Talk with Bing and Dennis. We're here today talking with John Wineglass. Uh, I'm going to start a completely different subject, and that is you have the, had the honor of performing for every president of the United States since Ronald Reagan. Is that correct? Yeah. And then also some people like King Hussein of Jordan. Right. So of all these seemingly incredible experiences, what is the biggest memory of yours? I remember um, when, for Ronald Reagan, I remember uh, being there in the White House. My my uncle was chief of Secret Service at that time, and uh, and him just coming by and tapping me on the shoulder and saying, "Good job." <laughs> and I mean, I mean, I was young. I was very, very young. You were performing with a chamber with, with, group. With the chamber group, like a like a string quartet. A string quartet. Um, Which string quartet? This was with the youth. Uh, this youth orchestra. This is our, our 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 youth orchestra. So we used to do annual concerts at the White House. Um, um, then another time I was doing, I used to do a lot of dinner parties for Jay Rockefeller and his family, Sharon, and, uh, and uh, for a lot of Democratic conventions with Bill Clinton. And uh, so, yeah, the, those were very memorable times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there any, any difference between doing this or doing a concert hall? Um, no, not really, not, 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 not really. I remember we were in the Soviet Union, we did American in Paris, and uh, um. Gorbachev was there, and he just waved from the balcony, <laughs> and that was a little surreal <laughs> <laughs> as, as, as a kid, especially before, it was before the Cold War ended, so. Where did you play for King Hussein? And um, that would have been at, at American University. Actually, his former wife um, um, w w attended there. Um, um, so when he, um, uh, yeah, his wife attended uh, American University, so she had a she had a connection to the university. So this was for a, a, an event there at the university at one point. What role does improvisation play in your composing? Since you are a jazz pianist and that is so much improvisation, how does that carry over into your composing? Okay, well, let me, let me clarify. Jazz pianist, I, I don't consider myself, I mean, I can improv, but I, you know, uh, Marcus Roberts is a very amazing uh, jazz pianist, and Chick Corea, those guys are amazing pianists. I dabble in it. So, but, but improvisation, though, is a very big part. I mean, you, when you look at Mozart, I mean, you know, it's the same, it's the same thing. It's basically taking... Uh, melodies and themes and creating new ideas. And so um, a lot of times when I'm um, doing voice sketches or memos, that's basically what, what that, that is. Um, and so um, it's a very big part of the composition process. And then, then it becomes basically um, um, dictation to myself for a transcription later. And you hold this basically all in your mind. What you improvise, what your thoughts, what you come up with, you hold it until you're able to put it into some form of Well, I, paper. as soon as I get the idea, I go somewhere and record it. You know, mm -hmm. so if I, in my studio downstairs, I'll, I'll go somewhere and put the ideas down because I'll lose them like that. So they don't, they don't stay. Um, right. They have to immediately be written down for me in particular. How does this process compare with the process of doing um, background music for, say, a, a television drama, um, where the it's already existing and you are adding to it? Explain that process. Well, the, uh, I was talking about this the other day, where uh, when you do music for film and TV, there's a there's a narrative that's there, and so the narrative drives what you do creatively. Um, uh, and so for me, if I watch a scene, I usually watch it for dialogue first, and then I go back and take a second look, and music instantly usually comes with, 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 the, with the scene by words, um, by you know, whatever the scene is setting up. It usually speaks to me that way. You know, the difference with that and concert hall music, though, concert hall music I consider is my music unabated. So there's no narrative driving it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's me. Right, you know, so you have more restrictions with the, with the, the film. With the film. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get a director in there, <laughs> and that changes a lot of things, so. So um, you think um, uh, the elements like that, it's um, probably most important for a composer, is that when you hear something, 
and uh, you see something, and somehow melody music will come into you. Yes, yeah, that's my personal experience, and it's it's very important to get that down immediately um, to not lose it. Um, there was one piece I was doing for um, a show uh, that I was ghostwriting for um, called Smallville uh, on the WB, and I remember getting a theme in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning. And when that inspiration hits, you get up, <laughs> go downstairs, <laughs> yeah. right? And now I'll have a notepad on my on my on my desk, and and we'll write that idea, and then go back to sleep, you know. Um, and so it's in the it's important to get the ideas down immediately. You when know? <laughs> sometimes you hit the wall, what do you do? <laughs> Interesting. I uh, and I when I moved to California, I did hit a wall, a composition wall for. Um, had done a lot of TV, and um, I just needed a break mm. um, from that. Um, the change from leaving New York City to to the shores of Pebble Beach and Monterey, it's a very different artistic uh, environment. Um, I'm used to old cities. I like New York. I love Vienna. I love you know uh, Paris and old cities with a lot of grit. texture. Texture. Yes, and you <laughs> feel that it's been there a long right. time. Right, so you go to a place like L.A., city of strip malls, and <laughs> That's right. you know, just you know, it has a different uh, um, kind of creative vibe, and so that was that was a struggle for me. So that that's the time I hit a wall, and for a year, wasn't really writing uh, a lot of music, um, and just trying to really uh, find uh, my voice uh, in a new way. Um, How did you get out of it? That's so funny you ask. <laughs> so insightful. Uh, my friend Simon Bull, he's a uh, he's an artist. He uh, has been commissioned by Obama, and Muhammad Ali to do their personal uh, paintings, and he, a good friend of Thomas Kincaid um, as well, he was one that told me you have to continue to write even when it's hard, uh, even if you feel like it's crap, just write it down mm. and continue. Beethoven, his um, in his days, you know, even when things are rough, you have to continue to write. And so that was a very valuable lesson that kind of pulled me out of that, um, uh, that funk for a while. And, uh, and I, I'll never forget it. Because he, he, he is currently such a prolific artist. I, I just asked him one day, how do you just, I mean, you're, you're, just, you're painting and every day. And he said, you know, you, you got to continue to do it. Even if you don't, you know, like it, you just... Put it on the side, and it could be a sketch later on. Um, uh, one piece that I wrote um, for a piano trio, that was one of those things that I had just kind of tossed to the side, and then 10 years later I get a commission and go back to my sketches, and it <laughs> <laughs> turns into a work. So. Once you had the effect of him on you, did, was it a quick uh, getting out of this, or did it take a long time? It, it took a, he, he was kind of my coach. Uh, it, took, it took a little while. Um, um, I had to adjust to the environment of, of, of California. Um, I was not really uh, a, a nature guy. You know, I was really, that was kind of not my thing. I was brick and city mortar kind of kind of guy. So it's so funny. I, I work a lot with the Big Sur Land Trust, um, and, and um, they had a, one particular person, one of their workers took me out to the Redwoods one time, and... Uh, that's new for me. Uh, so I took my viola out and started playing in the redwoods, and to hear the vibrations and, and the music come alive in the forest, was just, it was unbelievable. And so now it's so funny. I moved to California, total city guy, and now I help them raise money. Um, I'm doing a work <laughs> uh, based off of Big Sur landscape uh, next year. Um, um, through a um, particular festival and uh, com commissioning, they commissioned me as a, um, I'll be their resident artist in the month of October. So they give me 28 secluded properties just to sit out and, wow. and write music. So, oh, nice. so I've come a long way. Yes, from the city boy. <laughs> so. I think in your, uh, in your career, probably uh, you run into a lot of people, give you suggestions, right. and uh, a lot of you know, critics right. give you all kinds of, uh, you know, words, bad or good or whatever. How do you deal with it? Um, typically, most of reviews... Don't have... tell me you don't, <laughs> don't, 
<laughs> you ignore them. <laughs> that was my first answer, but I didn't even say that. So, <laughs> um, typically, uh, you know, I've basically had very good reviews. There's always that one, you know. <laughs> yes. Right. And um, um, and so I I I take you know constructive criticism criticism well, you know I. Um, and so I, I take it with a, with a grain of salt. You know, I, I, I heed to it, but I don't let it, you know, affect me. People have their opinions, you know, you, they, that's, that's their job. So um, Certain people will change their directions a little bit to fit into whatever people say. Uh, that's hard, right? Yeah, um, and when I say, when I talk about concert hall music, which is why I, I love composing concert hall music. That's my heart. Um, and that's me unabated. So what you see is what you get. Mm, right. <laughs> so there's no curbing that to fit some critics uh, uh, mold. You know, it's, it's, this, is, this is me, you know. Um, and, you know, you hire me to do a job, then that's, you're, you're hiring me. So, um, and that's kind of uh, the, way, the way I look at it um, and the way I live my life. The way you, the fact that you started as a violist and then played chamber music as a violist, mm -hmm. did that affect? I think you wrote quite a bit of chamber music. Mm -hmm. Is that the result? Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, piano trios, string quartets. We used to do all all the Mozart, all the Beethoven, all those quartets, and we so we we had at my conductor's house on Sundays for just music reading. So we mm. just go over there, you know, with wine and cheese and and just read through quartets. I, those days, you know, uh, Sundays would be that day. We would go and just kind of read through music. That's how I learned a lot of the, the, the quartets. And unfortunate that not that much is done today of that thing. No, it's not. In the families. It's, it's, and it's, the it's, it's, yeah. It's yeah. Okay. Speaking of chamber music, though, um, one chamber work, uh, "Darkness to Light." Uh, we'd like to hear a little bit of that. Can you introduce us to Darkness to Light? Okay, well, that's the name of the album. The album. Um, are you talking about the electronic? I'm talking about an Ode to a Princess is what oh, we're going to listen yes. to. Okay, yes. It's that, a wonderful piece, by the way. Excuse me? It's a wonderful piece. Oh, thank you very much. Uh -huh. um, that, when I moved to New York and I knew I was going to be studying with Della Joyo, I got my apartment in Staten Island, looking at the uh, Statue of Liberty. It's a great apartment. Um, on the BBC uh, in 97, 98, they announced that she had been in this wreck. And I had seven tones that came to my head immediately when I heard that. I didn't really know much about her, you know, her life or anything like that or royalty or how that all, but these seven tones came to me. And then this, the theme of the second movement came immediately. And then I wrote those down as sketches and put them away. Well then, twenty uh, what is it twenty uh, eleven rolls around, and I get commissioned by my friend Rebecca Jackson, a violinist here, went to Juilliard. Uh, she has a she has a festival, music in May, and she commissioned me to write a piano trio. Now initially it was for string quartet, um, but then she said I need it for piano trio. So I said <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, amazing players: Daniel Cho, uh, New England Conservatory; Amy uh, Yang from Curtis. Uh, amazing players, um, and so basically those were sketches that that I turned in, into this piece. And the first movement is um, basically this mysticness of Diana um, in, in my research of her and just finding out her. It's more new music kind of thing. The second movement is the car chase in, in Paris. And then the third movement is uh, Diana's Lament. We have two little sections, so let's listen to them and then we'll talk much more about them afterwards.
amazing music. The, the first part, obviously, was the chase. Right. And then the very melodic section, take over. Well, the, the, yeah, the second movement, uh, it's literally called the chase, and that's um, indicative of the, the car chase in, um, in Paris, and it ends in, in, in the crash. Uh, and then it go, moves into the third movement, which is entitled Diana's Lament. And it's basically a, a funeral procession, um, um, which is the theme that I talked about. Uh -huh, incredibly beautiful me <laughs> melody. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of the cello. Um, that's one of my favorite instruments to write for. Um, and so, um, again, that seven-tone row was in that, in that, that second movement at the car chase. Um, um, it was stated in the first movement, and in the second movement, uh, it moves at a seven-eight kind of rhythm, um, and then yeah, we end with the uh, Diana's lament. And Not to get too technical here, but when you say seven tone, it, that's similar to say a Schoenberg twelve tone. Exactly. The, you don't use one until you've used exactly. the seven. Okay. Right, right. But it's not strict. Not so strict. It's not, yeah. Okay. <laughs> not serialism. But okay. uh, but yeah, definitely uh, those seven tones just oddly um, came to my head when, when, when that was this, um, when that when that news broke. Um, and so I incorporated it in the composition um, and use and I use different tools like that. I mean we use you know um, serialism. I use that different components of it um, in, in the atonality world and the matrix and things like that as composition tools to to spawn ideas, you know retrograde inversion, inversions and things that will, help stimulate uh, ideas, you know, especially when I'm in a rut. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. How did the um, darkness to light, that this theme, mm -hmm. come to your mind? Well, the album, uh, it, it's, it, there are a lot of dark themes. Um, I mean, the death of a princess is the name of that sure. piece. Um, and so that's pretty dark. And then I have an electronic tape piece on there. Um, I'm sure I used FM synthesis and different things to create different things, um, um, sound palettes, and that's kind of, kind of dark. But then um, I have different works on there that are a little bit more lighter. And um, um, like there's a, a piano a sonata that's on there um, that's a little bit more uh, uplifting. And so that's why I titled it Darkness to Light. Um, because, uh, you know, I, I believe, I mean, life is life, and we do have a lot of hardships in, in, in life, and so I like to really focus on the positive, and that's indicative of the someone else's child piece, you yeah, know, it's right. indicative even of, uh, um, of a lot of other works that I've, I've composed. Have you ever had a dream, or has anyone said to you, why don't you write an opera one day? <laughs> <laughs> That is on the bucket list. Uh, actually, I was uh, with uh, Della Joyo, um, uh, Justin, the other, uh, uh, about a couple of months ago. I was listening to his new um, piece. He has Blue Mountain, um, which he's uh, Carter Bray on cello, and it's just an amazing piece. Um, and so I'm inspired. I, that's on the bucket list. You know, I don't know when. I've been Susan Mincer, We talked about her earlier. You, uh, have you written for voice? I have a piece for for interludes, uh, mezzo soprano. That for I, Susan. Yeah. So we're we're talking about uh, hopefully recording that. I've, I've, it's it's a new. It's based off of the Lord's Prayer, but it's a um, atonal piece, um, and we've we've yeah, we've talked about it. So yeah, yeah. She's she's amazing. Do you have a story for it? Um, no, no. It's just basically the Lord's Prayer in in Latin, um, and that's it. It's just put put to music. There's no there's no okay. there's no story behind that. One. If you decide to write an opera, um, do you have a something that you want to write about? Wow, that'd be interesting. It'd probably be something, maybe even something biblical. I don't even know. Oh, really? Know? Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. You know. Um, Especially doing a lot of these movies with you know, uh, and right. <laughs> you know, it'd be interesting to do something, you know, maybe Bathsheba or something, you know, some kind of. Oh, see, that's great. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe something like that. It'd probably be. Now it's an imprint. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> this is this is great. <laughs> you guys are inspiring. You're also a professor. Where, what you adjunct, teach? Adjunct, adjunct professor. professor. Where I, I teach theory um, at uh, Cal State University, 
Um, I do that, uh, you know, every, I was doing it for a while, full time at one point, and then kind of backed off because of commissions that were coming in. And, um, and I have a great course on the history of uh, film music, which uh-huh. I love. So I had my friend Alan Silvestri, who dis- did the music for Forrest Gump. Um, he mm. lives in, in Carmel. Uh, Mark Mancina, who did the music with Elton John and for Lion King. And I have, they, they come in and talk about the current trends of, of um, film music. But then I go from the silent film era all the way through Bernard Herrmann, Korn Gold, Shostakovich. Uh-huh. They all were film composers. Right. Um, and I, you know, come all the way through through to the current trends that are going to as far as um, film music is concerned. So that's a fun class. But you don't teach any composition classes. I do. Um, I, I've um, I've taught a few composition classes. I usually stick to theory. Um, um, just was, my schedule is always kind of kind of crazy, so was, I can't really always commit to to every um, to to all that time. And there's a composition guy that we have there that's full time. So. Because well, I wanted to ask for you both as a student of composition and then perhaps as a teacher, what can be taught as a composition teacher, and what do you just have inside of you? What is the purpose of a teacher? Of composition. Well, well, I go back to what Della Joyo did for me. He opened my eyes to um, atonality, and that introduction to Persichetti was priceless. And uh, so, you know, for me, I kind of use that model that he taught me. Persichetti is a book that, <laughs> if you're going to take composition from me, is usually <laughs> a book that you're going to probably pretty much have to order. So, um, so it's 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 helping them find their voice. Is 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 usually my 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 intent in working with the student, bringing out their strengths. Bringing out their strengths. Yeah. In your opinion, as a composer, what is the most important element in the composition process? Yes. Um, having different vehicles to be able to draw from, in having different uh, different compositional tools to be able to draw from, and the more you learn about. Um, you know, things like Shinkarian analysis or just using different things to come up with different ideas. It's kind of like being able to, um, different ingredients that you use in cooking. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, okay, there's a little paprika here, a little thing here to help the process. Um, and that's basically how I do it. So that's basically how I if, I, if I'm teaching someone, that's how. Well, usually a lot of people, uh, they like to cook, they think they know how to cook. But, now tell me, uh, do you think there's uh, something only certain people have it? I, you know what? I, I can, what I do with my students sometimes, I, I state my opinion of what I think, mm-hmm. you know, that, uh, and then they can make that decision for themselves, you know. So I, I try not to, to, to um, so yes, to your question, they either have it or they don't. <laughs> <laughs> so if they listen, <laughs> you want to play safe. You don't want to cut somebody's career short. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, you know, um, they're not me, and so I, right. I, I just try not to. There are some things that are just they, they don't work. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Um, and then that's when you figure out. Well, maybe you should probably not be doing this. That's you right. know, but um, but I do try to really hone in on what they are strong in and to to nurture. Uh, their creative process. You know? Even though we're out of time, and I have to ask you one final thing. Your name, has have you ever somehow gotten it into the idea, I mean, we think of a wine glass, we think of going around like this making a sound. Right. Have you ever gotten that into a piece of yours? <laughs> That's the opening of someone else's child. Oh, you're kidding. It starts off with wine glasses. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So you have, in fact, done. And they're tuned to, the, um, to, to a tone row that's, that's in, that, that exists in the first movement. Are so. you saying you never forget to promote yourself? <laughs> 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 well, yeah, that was definitely pun intended. <laughs> I wrote that in the program notes. I remember that. <laughs> As it, yeah, it opens up with wine glasses with these particular tones, and, and they were indicative of, of a child's spirit in its purest form. And then they go through this, you know, through life, which can be difficult. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, that's, yeah, wine glass. Yeah, it was definitely pun in terms yes. Well, John, thank you so much. This has been so fascinating to talk to you. And we thank you so much for coming by and spending this time with us. Cool. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. 
This has been Classic Talk with Bing and Dennis. Today, our guest has been John Wineglass.